all my favorite mechanics rolled into one game. But I do really fondly remember this game. It creates a lot of discussion. Just so intriguing and that's what got me first. The excitement from when we finished that game. When I speak, the words are coming up on the screen. Worst rash I've ever had in my life. Never was looking at me, but it was actually the dog that made the smell. They were only pointing because it was cold that day. Right guys, the time has come. We are going to do our top 10 board games of all time. I think it's a great way to also introduce ourselves in our tasting games. It is our personal tasting game, so if your top 10 games are not in this list, don't take it personally. It is just my top 10, his top 10. I haven't even looked at his top 10. He hasn't seen my top 10, so let's see how it goes. Yeah, let's let's crack on with it. I'm excited to uh, to share these with you. My number 10 best board game of all time. Okay. It's time stories. <laughs> I think this one's probably going to be on your list, but we'll wait for it to yeah. come around. Might be. Might be. May not, not be. be. Time Stories is an amazing escape room style game with sort of light RPG elements in it, depending on which mission you're running. And the group. Yeah, and the group. You don't have to necessarily play it as a role playing game, but it can be really fun to, to really get into it and, and play it like that. But at its core, it is just an escape room game, but it's one of the best escape room games. It's the best escape room game ever made. And you play it over like a span of like eight hours, a chapter or something like that. It's, I'll put an asterisk here and I think it's the asylum case that I, I put as my number 10. I think is the best case that we've done. They've done some other cases. The way the game works, right? You're sort of agents in the future and you go back in time because mm. there's been like some rift in time and you have to go and figure out what's going on. So you just sort of dumped into this, this time period. You have to solve the mystery. You have to escape the room. You have to figure out what's going on, what's causing this time rift. You're sort of working together, but it almost sort of replicates that feeling of, hey, all right, you go that way and you go that way and mm. I'll, I'll go this way. And then we'll, we'll convene at the end and we'll sort of put our thoughts together and see if we can figure it out. And the way it does that, is that you pick up a card, so you have like a series of cards. We'll get some B-roll of this, right? Yeah. Um, but you have like a series of cards, and each of the team members who goes into a particular area can, can pick up their card and they read it individually, and then they come back and say, this is what I saw. And they can't sort of repeat, repeat it word for word. They kind of just have to describe what they saw and, and, and what, the, what their thoughts are afterwards. So that's where I think it does the role-playing bit like so well. It mm. sort of really imitates that feeling of, oh man, there's a mystery going on and this is, this is, these are my thoughts. So what, what, what can we sort of put together and piece together yeah. to try and figure it out? I, I think it's one of the earliest sort of board games we played and this was a recommendation off of Dice Tower. So they love this game and it was an awesome recommendation by them because I loved it too. We played it as brothers and just had the greatest time ever. That was a great experience. Um, we've mentioned them before, but our two other brothers don't like playing board games with us, but they loved time stories. So maybe this is a recommendation for people who aren't massively into board games. It's not really a strategy game, so it probably has a reasonably sort of broad appeal, doesn't it? I, I remember the excitement from when we finished that game. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we were like, well, we need to get the next one. <laughs> there's, there's, there's the most amazing twist in that game, right? Yeah. At the end of it, anybody who's played the Asylum case is going to be like, yes, oh my God, that was just the most insane like twist at the end. What an experience. It was, it was an amazing experience. And if you haven't played it, mm. you should go play it. It's, Definitely. Am it's amazing. Top 10 game, easily. Yeah. Uh, and the uh, Dragon Halt one? Yeah, was I think... Was it Dragon Halt? No, it wasn't Dragon Halt, so that's... Uh, you're, you're thinking of the Fantasy Flight game. game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was their own sort of uh, high fantasy universe sort of D&D-esque, but I think cool it was universe. sort of like D&D in France or something is yeah. kind of like how they did it. That was the second best one I've played. I'm really excited to play the pirate one now. Yeah. And now that we're talking about it, <laughs> we should totally play the pirate one. Have we got the pirate one? Luke has it, so we'll All get right. in touch with Luke. We'll get in touch with Luke. Okay. <laughs> Amazing game. Totally agree. Uh, you know what? It, it, I, I forgot about that game. So. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's not in your top 10. That's <laughs> fine. If you've got different top 10s, it's more, more interesting anyway, yeah, right? Yeah. So. No, that was amazing. That was, yeah. Right, my number 10. Deception, murder in Hong Kong. Ooh, you are. <laughs> okay. Now, Deception, murder in Hong Kong it is very similar to kind of, it's a deduction game. So you've got your werewolves. A social deduction. Social game. deduction yeah. game. I mean, there's loads of social deduction games. I can think of like Secret Hitler, um, Avalon, Quest, all of yeah. those sort of games. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a really popular genre of, of board games, isn't it? And I think it wouldn't be a top 10 list without a social deduction game. So originally, the game came out in China or Hong Kong uh, as CS files. And my understanding is that Tom Vassell actually approached Grey Fox and said, check this game out, you know, you need to do something with it. And then they redid it into Deception Murder in Hong Kong. Like in the UK copy though, we actually laugh about it, even though it's Deception Murder in Hong Kong, you've got two languages on the cards, haven't you? Ours is English and then it's German on the other side. So we've basically got Deception Murder in Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> the game itself, you've got one forensics uh, scientist and then you've got the murderer. So the forensic scientist is giving clues but cannot speak you've got a murderer amongst a bunch of the investigators and is trying to find the obviously who done it 
But in this, what's really interesting is that you've got kind of a row of four cards and another row of four cards. You've got items and you've got, uh, no, the murder weapon and you've got the clues or the item clues or something like that. Everyone closes their eyes, the murderer's eyes are open, the forensic's eyes are open and the murderer will say, this is my item and this is my clue. And then closes his eyes and everyone open and then the forensic scientist is then trying to give clues towards those particular things and get everyone else to work out who the murderer is. And not only who the murderer is, but what is the actual clue and what was the murder weapon itself. Now that I think is really interesting for this kind of social deduction game because it creates a lot of discussion in a group where usually it's just, oh, I'm pointing at you because I think you look funny right now. This actually gives you something tangible to work around. The interesting part of that is from a murder perspective, am I picking something which is just totally opposites? Am I giving something which is maybe very close to each other. You know, you, you really have to think about this as a murderer. It's not just trying to look less suspicious in the game. I think you sort of described it there, what makes this such a special social deduction game and the fact what really separates it from all of the others is the fact that you actually have like a series of clues to, to sort of base your judgments off of. And then there's the clues that the forensic scientist is giving you. I really loved social deduction games. Like I'd always love to play Werewolf, mm. Mafia, all of the ones where it's just like, oh, let's just point fingers. And it's, it's fun to point fingers. Don't yeah, get me wrong. It's yeah. definitely fun to point fingers. But when I played that, I was like, suddenly there's a strategy to this game rather yeah. than just pointing fingers. Yeah. And hands down, it's the best social deduction game yeah, on yeah. the market. I've not played one better than it. Yeah. Um, and people can argue all they want about Quest and Avalon and mm -hmm. Secret Hitler. The foundations of it are just sort of pointing fingers and who looks suspicious, mm -hmm. right? And when you're playing with you, you'd never look <laughs> suspicious when you're the, always the most suspicious person, right? <laughs> the official traitor, you know? Mm -hmm. S season three traitors coming. <laughs> He'll <laughs> so be the next winner of that. <laughs> it does social deduction better than any other game in my opinion. Yeah. I've always had the experience where like, all right, this is a rubbish clue. Hopefully I've given enough sort of hints to, to my to my teammates that this is a rubbish clue mm. and, and hence left it for last. Mm. And then they always get fixated on that one. And they're like, oh my God, he said this and that that, that must mean it's this person. And I'm like, no, that person's talking. It's like, what, what are we doing? Like you can't. My ninth best board game of all time is Seventh Continent. Oh, wow. <laughs> Did you forget yeah. about this game? No, I didn't. I, okay, I, that's I, I considered it. Yeah. I, I thought you wouldn't consider it because I feel like we haven't sort of spoken about this game yeah. in a long time. Yeah. But I do really fondly remember this game. It's, I think it's one of the best two-player experiences we ever had yeah, as like a co-op yeah. experience. That was amazing. An exploration survival style game with sort of puzzle solving elements to it. And it's it's a tile-based game. So you, you sort of flip a tile and you're moving across this map. And the, the, the setting around it is just so intriguing. And that's what got me first, right? It was this sort of, this other continent has suddenly mm -hmm. sort of appeared and it's it's just total mystery what what's going on when you're hearing about all these strange mm -hmm. things it's sort of like is it like 1920s or something like that yeah. is, is that the sort of setting of it yeah and you travel by plane and you land there and then suddenly you're, you're stranded there and you need to figure out what is going on yeah. on this this continent on this island and there's going to be mysteries all the way along mm. this i'm not going to say any more in terms of the story because i think it's I, I, one of the things i sort of read online when we were thinking about buying the game is actually the less you know about the sort of setting mm. and, and the, mm. the, the surrounding sort of theme of it, probably the better. Yeah. So I'll stop talking about theme, but I'll talk about the mechanics. It's a survival game, but it doesn't instantly sort of reveal itself as a survival game. Mm. And you sort of slowly figure out how you're supposed to survive in this. And it's, it's quite a tough game, but mm. then once you sort of, once everything clicked for us at least, then we're like, oh, you know, we know how to do this. We, mm. we know how to sort of survive longer and, and explore further. And it's one of those games where you're like, all right, we, we sort of screwed that run up, let's try it again. And that knowledge is really, really powerful. Like you have in, in some sort of like video games, like. You know, like I'm trying to think of like Mist or something. So mm. every, every, anybody's ever played Mist, it's almost like this sort of walking simulator, puzzle solving sort of game where knowledge is really power. And then that is knowledge is is, is a lot. Of, it's really mm. powerful. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and sort of under, understanding your surroundings can be really, really useful. A lot of people argue that it works best as a solo game. I've never played it solo. And we've sort of mentioned this before. When neither of us are hugely into solo games. We sort of enjoy each other's company enough that we can play games together. And okay. I think that, you know, if you've got somebody like that, then you should probably play it with them because it's, it's a lot of fun. But like, if you like solo games, this is a great recommendation for a solo game. Yeah. It's not the easiest game to get hold of. I think you can only buy it directly from them. It never sort of came mm. to retail. We, we've never been able to stock it in the shop or anything. Yeah. Regardless, I'm still going to recommend the game because I think experience unlike anything in the board game space. What were your experiences of the game? The biggest revelation with the game was how it did not hold my hand in any way. Yeah. It was, there you are, 
do something. That's the right way to sort of yeah. manage these sort of games. And I, I just like, I'd love it. Like when in, in video games or in board games where you just, your hand's not held all the way through. Yeah. And it's for you to figure out. And, and this just does that perfectly, yeah. right? It's, it's a really thoughtful design. Yeah, yeah they, they, they really thought about every aspect of it. It's, it's a special game and we should get back to it because we've still got mm. more chapters to yeah. explore. Cool game. Awesome, cool game. awesome, yeah. awesome, awesome game. My number nine, <laughs> this might surprise you actually. Okay. Yeah. My number nine is Millennium Blades. <laughs> wow, that's surprising. <laughs> that is actually surprising. Millennium Blades came out in 2016 by Level 99. And what an original game that was. It's a simulation of a trading card game, but not just the trading card game itself. It's going from a starter deck all the way into a tournament situation. And the way it simulates that without actually being a trading card game is just brilliant. I think if you're into trading card games, you're really going to enjoy it. If you're into board games, you're just really going to enjoy it. I, I would add to that, if you're into drafting, drafting, like yeah. drafting yeah. trading card games, yeah. you're really going to enjoy this or you would really enjoy the pre-release experience. It yeah. almost feels like that yeah. in, it, captured in a board game. You get the feeling of cracking boosters, you know, collecting rare cards that will make your deck more powerful. It just gives you so much in, in that package. You cannot actually comprehend just by hearing about the game and on, even once you've read the, some of the rules, you, you really can't comprehend the game until you start playing it. And then it just starts clicking and makes so much sense. It almost just doesn't seem sound like it's going to work, does it? When you sort of read it on paper, like mm. how, how are they going to capture that experience, mm. right? And I'm somebody who's an avid TCG player. Yeah. I love TCGs. It's just one of my favorite pastimes. Yeah. I'm just heavily involved in lots of TCGs, yeah. building lots of decks. Hearing about a game like this just makes you very, very intrigued. Mm. And it delivers. And when you're in the TCG space as well, the parodies that you, you yes. notice with Magic and <laughs> Yu-Gi-Oh! <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant. Really? It's, it's probably taken influence from stuff like drafting and pre-release, cr probably created from like magic. But I think the booster design that they've done is mm. very much like Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah. It is like, no. it's, it's a pun on Yu-Gi-Oh, yeah. isn't it? So any Yu-Gi-Oh players would probably really like this. And essentially it's two games in one where you play the first part of the game where it is basically like an e economy game and, and just building up the hand of cards to make something that's going to synergize. And then you have the second part of the game, which is more like Libertalia, what was it? Libertalia. Libertalia. Yeah. Libertalia. It yeah. really plays very similar to Libertalia. So if you played Libertalia, you'll understand where you're playing your cards in a sequence. So once a card is down, it's kind of down. And then the next card has to combo off of the previous. Following that and following that is it's just what a brilliant system. Yeah, so Valbra is more of a recent release um, that mm. kind of took that system. And it is, that, that's also a fantastic game. Mm. So if you like those sort of games, I'd recommend that one too. Because mm. oh, it uses that same sort of system. You place a card, have an effect. And we're all sort of making a line of cards and mm. combos are happening as, as you're sort of playing them. It's, it's an awesome game. I, I totally just forgot about this one. Um, mm. And I, I took, I looked at the BGC sort of top 200 or 300 to look for inspiration. <laughs> I don't think it was that high up in the BGC. No, list. I don't think it is. I, I don't think there's that many people who have access to it because I know that it's having another print yet that's coming to retail pretty soon. Yeah, there's, there's not a lot of people who talk about this game. It deserves more credit. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, if you got Resonance. if you like both TCGs and board games, um, check out Millennium Place. It's awesome. Number eight, <laughs> my eighth best board game of all time. The Search for Planet X. Oh. So The Search for Planet X is a logic deduction game where you're playing an astronomer searching for this missing planet in our solar system. So if you've ever played games like Cluedo, The Awkward Guess is another really popular one. If you've played any of those games, you probably have an idea what, what this sort of game is. It's almost like a puzzle where you've given, you're given some rules, some mathematical rules. There's like a central board where it sort of represents sort of like a, a space map and you're trying to figure out which of these sections this mysterious pla uh, planet X is, is sort of hidden. It uses an app. I have sort of mixed feelings on apps in, in board games. I generally would prefer games without apps, but if apps are done well, then I can appreciate that. And I think this is an example of an app done very, very well. No internet connection required. Mm -hmm. You just download it and it has a small footprint on your actual phone space and everything. So you, you do you do need the app, but it, it, because it does some of the logic rules and makes sure it's every, everyone's sort of working together or everyone's sort of working towards the same mm -hmm. puzzle. I do really like logic deduction games and I feel like I wanted to mention one, at least one logic deduction game in my top 10 list. And it's pretty hard because there's a lot of good ones on the market. Cryptid. Yeah, Cryptid. Oh God, I totally forgot about that one. I think this probably, it just does it for me over Cryptid. But Cryptid is very close. I think that might be my second favorite mm. logic deduction game. Yeah. But I think Search for Planet X just gets this really tight experience. I think I suppose one of the downsides of it, you kind of just need four players for it to really work well. It's almost just like this race to figure out where Planet X is mm. and, and, and see who's almost like the smartest person who can put their pieces together. And you're constantly looking at your board and like, oh, this doesn't make any sense. Like I've broken some rules here, right? I don't know about be... smartest person because I actually do win this <laughs> do you? every time. I never win this. I never win this. Um, I hope that's 
doesn't say anything about <laughs> a smart IRR. It's just so satisfying if you have that mathematical style brain or if you like Sudoku mm. or, or those sort of games. You're probably going to love this game. I think it's the best of its kind. And if you don't like this or if the theme doesn't appeal to you, try Search for Lost Species, which is their sort of semi-sequel or yeah. spin-off to it, um, which we just did a review on recently and we, we really liked it. It looks fantastic. It looks like they've developed the formula a little bit on it as yeah. well. If not, there's also Turing Machine, um, mm. which is which sells really well. That's a, that's a really popular game. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sure lots of people have heard about this. Awesome game. Um, I think there's nothing else like that satisfaction of when the puzzle sort of just fixes itself together and you have that mm. light bulb moment. Yes, I figured <laughs> it out. Is this? And you, and you put it into the app and you're like, no, that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that's my usual experience with the games. <laughs> my number eight is Summoner Wars. Second edition specifically. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know what? I actually forgot about this one on the list. Um, yeah. But it's a great game. It is amazing. It's magic meets Warhammer. It has unique factions. You're basically playing your cards onto a board and then your cards then become units which you can move around the board. It's had continued support since it's been released. There's always new decks coming out every couple of months or so. You need to try it. You absolutely need to try it. It's a high tactical dueling card game with a huge variety of decks and then deck building options it has the deck building element although i never do the deck building myself i just prefer using the kind of set the pre-con decks themselves and just play with them i think that's a lot of fun anyway i would also say it's, it's very chess like but then giving you so much theme with what you're actually doing in the game the duel the battle i, I love the game as you probably know because I have a lot of it it's the theme that really sells it i think they just get this awesome sort of universe of, of like magic and high fantasy right and each faction just feels unique i think it's it's a great game it's a com tight competitive experience as well which ticks all the boxes for me which mm -hmm. makes me think why was i so stupid as to forget this from my <laughs> list <laughs> if you like board games if you like trading card games if you just like dueling if you like strategy games this has got a, a lot of appeal mm -hmm. and it's really well priced <laughs> is it my turn yeah what number are we on number seven number seven okay probably don't need to spend too much time on this because it's been mentioned already we've got some overlap it was Deception Murder in Hong Kong. No, oh, we got some overlap. Yeah, we got some overlap. Yeah. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, we've got some overlap. Deception is awesome. I think we've talked about it enough. So we'll, we'll just, I'll, I'll quickly just say how great a time I've had playing this game. If you're going to pick up one social deduction game, it should be this. Yeah. Okay. My number seven. Dwellings of Elderville. Oh man, I totally forgot about this one as well. <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Yes. Dwellings of Elderville. What can I not say about this game? It is absolutely amazing. Let's forget the game for a moment production quality best game trays ever best game the game trays are so vital to the game as well because the game trays is, you pull out the game tray and there you are your player set give that player the game tray he's set give the next player a game tray he's set and then once you open the tray the tray has all the information on there how much does this unit cost how many of these items or resources can you keep it is just brilliant the production on this one and then the game, it's so many moving components in the game in terms of different mechanics happening. It's a hybrid game in the same way that like Scythe might be a hybrid game. So I think at its core, it has a sort of worker placement elements and, and placement, resource management, yeah. but it's also an area control. And an engine builder. And an engine builder, yeah. yeah. I mean, it is, yeah. It's got aspects of all of those. I think it's kind of like the cool trendy thing to do with your big strategy game is to make it a hybrid game in some ways. Yeah. And I think Don Meyer games really sort of set off that trend with Scythe. Another interesting thing is obviously the, the unique workers, workers that have different abilities. Once you start upgrading into them and buying them, then you have a wizard who can, you know, do extra things. And I, I think that's absolutely brilliant as well. Not just having this, you know, a worker going out, he's a worker and you've got a bunch of workers to work, you know, do things. These workers are all unique, you know, that's really brilliant. I think the monsters that are a really cool addition to that yeah. as well. So it's been a while since I played it, so correct me if I'm wrong, but you could sort of, you could go into combat against other players, but you could also go to combat against the monsters as well. Mm. And then you could gain control of the monsters too. Mm. On, on some of the monsters, maybe yeah. it was on all yeah. of them or something. And, and I think that's a really cool idea. To, it, it really just, it did so much in the game, didn't it? It did it so successfully. I, I, I actually, I, I feel a bit bad about not mentioning this one. It's, it's, a, it's a really awesome game. Yeah. And the way the world expands as well with the board, you, board, you've got the, the hex tiles and then people start discovering new places. And then all of a sudden you've got a new hex here, which does a different worker item. And it means you've never got the same game twice. You know, it's always something evolving going on. The factions as well, they've got good level of asymmetry. It's not root where it's you're tr teaching five different games. It's you can teach the same game and it's an easy game to teach as well. Surprisingly, it looks a lot harder when you see the 
board presence. You say, oh no, what is this? Yeah, Trays is definitely a part of that. Yeah. I think it's one of the best examples of a game that uses hybrid sort of mechanisms and mechanics and really melds it together into like a really perfect mm. whole piece. Yeah. That is one of the best examples of a game that just really puts it all together and it just feels like this one, you know, you know, like all the cogs fit perfectly and suddenly it makes this beautiful game. Combat in Dwellings, you found that even if you went into combat and you lost in combat, it wasn't game breaking. It wasn't the end of the world. You know, it felt like a little minor niggle. Yeah. But then you you still came back with a reward, even yeah. for losing the combat, which you could then use for other things. Yeah, I suppose you can go you can go in either direction, can't you? You can go like side where combat is just like super mm. punishing, very very costly, mm. um, to the point where like you really have to think about before going into combat with mm. somebody. You have to see the perfect opportunity to go go into it. This is a bit different, it sort of encourages it a bit more, doesn't it? It's like, yeah, go on, you have a battle against each other. Dwellings of Eldervale probably does get the recognition it deserves. There's mm. definitely like a following for it. And yeah. whenever we manage to get stock of it, it just sells out. It's just not widely available, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think theme in the game has done really well, especially with the magic tracks. You know, I yeah. think that that's done incredibly well in yeah, the game. Yeah. And then you've got a game which had dice and you know me and dice not exactly best of friends but the dice management in the game was just done really well yeah it's good use of dice it's great i i do i live in zelda is an no, awesome game it. it's just a I sweet game love it number six mm -hmm. okay i don't think this was gonna be on your list okay okay my sixth best board game of all time is it's a wonderful world oh wow okay yeah have you played? You have played it, haven't played you? played it. Yeah, I don't think you played it nearly as Not much as me. Much you. It's a game that we've been playing quite a lot um, mm. on our Saturday uh, board game sessions. Yeah. This is a friend of ours owns it. And I, the more I play it, the more I enjoy it. And I, I am somebody who really enjoys engine building it. And I, you know, I adore Terraforming Mars and all, all of these sort of other games like Ark mm. Nova. I was a big fan of Seven Wonders and we, we both talked about how much we really like Seven Wonders as a game. It's a great gateway game. It's not super complex and it can play at a large player count. But often when you sort of play games at a large player count, you lose that sort of depth and strategy. You often can yeah. get a sort of like the sweet spot of board games, which is probably about four, three or four players. It's a Wonderful World is sort of more tuned to play at four players, but it's also a drafting engine building game. So you draft a hand of cards, you take one card, yeah. and say this is going to be part of my engine and you pass the, the hand of cards over to the other person and you get another hand of cards and you take another piece mm -hmm. into your engine. And eventually you have this engine and then you're going to sort of decide how you're going to produce these buildings. I'm going to pop some resources down it and these guys are going to, uh, these buildings are going to make me meet more resources. Eventually it's going to score me points. But this is just like, you just get your engine going and then suddenly it's like the game's over. <laughs> One of those ones that you, you really, every sort of tiniest decision in, mm. that, in, in that game is going to contribute towards you, your final piece. And, and you really, really, really have to think early uh, mm. on about well, what direction are you going to go in um, and sometimes things just don't go your way. I, it just I played this game so much, and I've, I've seen so many sort of different outcomes of how how your engine can be built and what, what what happens at the end. You often find like there's these core sort of pieces to your engine that you need to just get the early production going, right? Of, of the sort of basic sort of um, resources. And we had a game last week, and none of us had any of these cards available to us. We were just like, you know, did somebody like stack this deck or something? We can't get any of those pieces out. We all did terribly. It, yeah. We did absolutely awful, but yeah. immediately afterwards we were like, yeah, let's let's have another game. So we, we had another game. It was the total opposite. Mm. We all scored like, like the lowest score was more than twice as much the high score on the previous round. Like you have to sort of be fluid as to what hand of cards you're going to be dealt. You, you're thinking on the fly. It's not an overly complex game, but mm. I think it probably takes like sort of one game to really figure out how the system works. But it takes, you know, a lifetime to really master the best way to go around. It kind of reminds me of an Uwe Rosenberg game where you're like, yes, I finally got my engine going. Game over. That's it. <laughs> oh, by the way, you didn't feed in with it and everyone just died. And you're just like, no. But like <laughs> you get to the fourth round and you're like, yes, I've got my engine going, but you haven't scored any points. So it, it can be really, really tight. But I like those experiences. If you like engine building games, you should totally give this a chance. And it's one of those games that plays in probably about half an hour. Okay, my number six, an acronym. Worker placement, you've got once again the different workers, the scientists who did different things can only go to certain spots and blah, blah, blah. You've got the whole timeline thing. This is one of the coolest things. Such a thematic game, but what's essentially a very Europe game. Timeline thing is basically you borrow from the future and then you must pay it back before the future becomes the present. Otherwise, it causes like a paradox, happen. doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that Metal Gear Solid moment where yeah. the, you have the time paradox. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't see many sort of plays on time in, in board games. Yeah. Um, and It's like the Chris Nolan of board games. Totally non-linear board games. It's <laughs> linear, but it's, it's actually non-linear, you know? Yeah. I think it's USB on this game. 100% is that timeline. I suppose in other aspects, you know, it's quite a traditional worker placement game. Mm. You go here, you get resources, but that's what really makes it special is that timeline. And it's so, so unique. I think it does everything else really well though. Like yeah. it, the universe it creates and this is probably the only game where i would say you want to get the plastic miniatures expansion plastic miniatures just i don't know why 
it adds so much theme to the game you know you actually feel like you're sticking your little people inside of the mech suit and then you send the mech suit out yeah it's so cool it, it, it is actually really cool some of the miniatures in that are actually yeah. really really amazing it's it's a it's a really tight experience i love it it's a, it's a great game i totally forgot about mentioning this one on my list what i don't think anachrony is my favorite euro game of all mm. time yeah. so that's probably why it did come on my list i love most of what turkey does definitely for me one of my favorite game designers of all time one of my favorite sci-fi i'm just giving away clues there this is one of my favorite <laughs> sci-fi games thanks for watching this far i hope you've been enjoying our top 10 list i just wanted to quickly mention that gathering games is also an online store and a physical store why not check out the gathering games website below to see all these games that we're talking about plus much much more like subscribe and leave us a comment below thanks it helps so much now let's get back and see what rubbish games Sarth has picked. Five. One of my favorite sci-fi games of all time is Terraforming Mars. Ooh. I I think anybody who knows me would have known that I was going to put this on my list. Yeah. I, I think Terraforming Mars is awesome. I think it's probably my favorite sort of drafting engine building game. It's a muddy game, this. It, it's got a lot of moving parts. It could be way slicker than it is. It could be shorter than it is. But for some reason, I'm just so drawn back to this game. It's also a little bit ugly. But I think at this point, it's almost like I have an ugly child and I sort of have this sort of connection with this. And I'm like, it's beautiful to me, you know? Yeah. And I think I look at the board for me Mars and I think actually it's beautiful to me. It just sort of explains how fondly I think of this game just as a design piece. It's an amazing game. It, it really just deserves credit as being one of the greatest games of all time. Mm. And there's a lot of people um, and YouTubers and creators who probably agree with me on this. It's just so satisfying to, to get your engine put together in the beginning of that game you just feel so tight on resources you just can't do anything in the rounds of just finishing so soon mm. like i just did nothing in that round well you know when am i going <laughs> to actually be able to do something in this yeah. game and then slowly it builds up over this span of like three or four hours and yeah. you're like oh god you know what i'm, I'm one of the most powerful corporations now on mars <laughs> and i've terraformed this it's all about you know sort of increasing the oxygen levels increasing the heat and that sort of element of science fiction and the mm. particular you, know, you know the science aspect of it just appealed to me so much and you you have lots of sort of cards that sort of represent buildings which are more sort of scientific and mm. you have some that are more sort of fictional it's so thematic mm. you know it does definitely capture that feeling of here we are on Mars. And if you went on Mars to try to terraform it, you're not going to do it overnight. You know, mm -hmm. Rome wasn't built overnight. And it, it captures that feeling at the end of it that you, you put a lot of heart and soul and your effort into terraforming Mars. It's definitely for, for a type of player. Like, I don't think it's a hugely interactive game. If you're the sort of player that doesn't enjoy the solitaire games nearly as much or the low interactive games as much, but have an interest in, in terraforming Mars as a franchise, Ares Expedition might be the one for you. The base version of terraforming Mars just really appeals to me. And it has a great digital version, which you can play. It's one of my favorite strategy games of all mm. time and i don't think i'm surprising anyone with it if you haven't played it why <laughs> yeah. haven't you played it yeah it's pretty good game pretty good pretty good pretty good, game. Pretty good. Yeah. my list is better though your list is better yeah. what is it number five yeah, if you say terraforming mars now my number five surprisingly is not terraforming oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> my number five is spirit island now first of all i would want to mention it is a high complexity game and it's not the kind of game you're going to take to a big group and you this is a game that dedicated people want to sit down. And I do probably prefer it with just two players. We we only really play it together. Yeah, I, I think we could probably chuck a third player in there. I yeah. definitely would not want to play it any more than that. Yeah. This is Spirit Island. Everything's going great. Everyone's happy. Yay, bunny rabbits and big trees and big gardens. And then all of a sudden, the European colonizers come and destroy <laughs> everything. So who are you going to call? Are you going to call the spirits is who you're going to call? You're going to call the spirits of the island. And yeah. the spirits, they're going to terrify these colonizers and tell them to go away before they spread everywhere in a nutshell spirit island it's a it, it's a cooperative game very much pandemic s where you have a threat that's taking over this land base and you have to minimize it but what it does so interesting is the spirits themselves they all have very unique abilities they all work very differently then mastering your spirit not only mastering your spirit but synergizing with the other spirit that is being played as well you know one spirit with another spirit will never be the same as an that same spirit with a totally different spirit some of the heaviest decision making because it is life and death going on out there and then you have to really think that okay i'm gonna take a big hit over here but maybe I can minimize something over here. Oh man, that gives me a headache sometimes. It can be really tough to sort of balance the difficulty of a cooperative game, right? And it sort of veers into making it more difficult so you get a greater sense of reward. And I think to try and pace that difficulty throughout the game as well can be really challenging, but somehow the designers of this just do it so well where you feel like you're just getting totally overwhelmed and you're, you're trying your hardest. You're, you're doing absolutely everything to overcome the colonists. And it feels like you're just about to lose the game and then suddenly, you know, you have that moment. You're like, we've done this. We did it. Yes. <laughs> 
yes, that's it. And then it's such a satisfying experience. Oh, what a game. This is my sort of perspective on the theme. I think it appeals to me in a, in a really significant way. Uh, the fact that it's kind of, this is, this is the anti-colonialist game, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's lots of discussion online about, about sort of colonialism in games and there's people sort of standing on both sides of the argument and I can, I can see on both sides of the argument, but somebody from a heritage that was defined by colonialism, I, I stand on one side of the argument and this game represents those sort of people, the people who, who are traumatized by, by all this sort of thing and makes a game and embraces it and represents those people. I think it's probably fair to say that this game of the Spirit Island is probably New Zealand that it's trying to represent and it's sort of telling that story and telling it in a new light and, and representing people who deserve to be represented. And that's what's so special to me I and mean, to make such a beautiful piece of artwork and design as a game around it. It's awesome. You could take the theme out of this game and it would still be an excellent game. So yeah. it's not just the theme for this game. No, if you're a first time board game or you, you haven't played that many board games, it's probably not my number one recommendation for you. If you're looking for another sort of cooperative game that's not necessarily as, as difficult, but something that's challenging, look at Pandemic. And and then once you play that, you could totally try um, Spirit Island. Mm. But they're quite different games. Beautiful. Spirit Island. Love it. All right, my number four. Mm. is Caverna by Uwe Rosenberg. Love this game. I talk about it all the time and people often ask me what's one of you, what's your favorite game when they come into the shop and when I look on the shelf this is the one I tend to talk about the most. A worker placement game, quite a traditional worker placement game I suppose by Uwe Rosenberg who's the master of worker placement games mm. where you are managing a village of cave dwarves yeah. yeah so you can sort of make cave dwellings mm. and reproduce more dwarves and mm -hmm. you've got a farm that you're trying to manage and the farm's kind of like this polyominoes game which Uwe Rosenberg absolutely loves so you know think Tetris or something like that where you got different shaped pieces and you sort of fit them together you can grow plants and you can grow like animals and stuff like that and then you've got this whole sort of board which sort of give you perks and give you direction as to how do you want to make your village you know there's the different aspects that you can sort of really develop in in your village are you really going to focus on the on, on the cave you and sort of make the dwellings there you're going to go and mine in the caves and get mm. like gems and stuff from there you could go on expeditions mm. you're going to focus on that or you could really focus on your farm or you could sort of take a blend of all mm. of them i mentioned it in our last video the, the tier list that we did how much i just love this sort of gives you the opportunity to to role play um, the village how you want it to do and i just love the fact that you can make it a totally vegan village <laughs> not necessarily going to score a lot of points by doing that <laughs> But you can if you want to, by default, always try to do that now. Up until that point that I'd really played this game, I always found worker placement games sort of really lacked any sort of theme. And I remember when I was sort of talking to you about it the first time when we were really sort of just getting into the whole board game scene. And I was like, well, what do you mean that it sort of like lacks theme? Like, what, what you know, when we were playing something like Lords of Waterdeep. You explained this really well. You said, uh, you know, you pick up this colored cube and then you place this colored cube here and then you pick up some other colored cubes and you exchange these cubes. But that game works perfectly fine if you just ignore the theme and it doesn't really capture you you know it doesn't really sort of simulate that experience but Uwe Rosenberg actually just stuffed so much theme into this Up until that point I'd never felt in a Euro game that actually simulated that experience of what that theme actually is in it and you're making all of these tough decisions and it's brutal it's yeah. an absolutely brutal game but if you've ever played any Rosenberg games you probably already know that that mm. you will definitely be penalized and punished for things to happen or decisions that you make and it ends before you really get your engine going those really skilled players will really shine in this game and this is in my opinion the best Uwe Rosenberg game I, I could do my top 10 Uwe Rosenberg games and talk about 10 games of his but I didn't feel like I wanted to talk about many more games of that sort of style in the top 10 list just to mm. give some coverage for the games you introduced me to this game what, what, what are your thoughts on it <laughs> i think it is one of the most expansive worker placement games there's so many options almost endless options trying to decide on am i going to play in this fashion am i going to focus on my caves am i going to focus on my farming it gives you so much freedom sometimes i don't even care if i win or lose in that game i just want to do what i want to do you know yeah i definitely care about winning in that game but i can't <laughs> seem to win in that game like every time we play it it's like you're miles ahead fairs well, what's going on like everyone's like trembling looking at my board because I've got like you know all the workers I possibly can get and then I'm like oh wait what, what can I do with these workers I can't do anything and then, and then I don't get any points a lot of mouths to feed that's the <laughs> a lot of mouths to feed are you, are you alright with negative scoring in game I love it so do I. <laughs> I actually love it and I, I don't know I, I think it just adds to the whole stress of the situation I mean just think about it like just take a third person perspective on the whole thing right you're just a, a bunch of people sat around cardboard and, and little wooden meeples and it can evoke so much emotion in you like all that stress mm. from like all of that decision making that is what, what this whole hobby is about is to, to capture those sort of moments and, and capture those sort of emotions and I think that is just one of the best uh, you know you, do, you don't traditionally think of worker placement games to, to really do that but this does it mm. better than any other cute dogs and babies number four this might be no surprise to you <laughs> Dune Imperium yeah. I know you don't love it as much as I do. <laughs>
<laughs> but I adore okay. Dune Imperium. Those who control the spice control everything, Fez, and I want to control the spice. <laughs> Saying that, this game really gives me that feel. You know, it is for me the closest thing to the Dune world. And you've got so much going on in the game. So many different mechanics happening in this one game. You've got card management, deck building, worker placement. Then you've got the combat that's also going on at the end of each round. You've got different uses on the different types of cards as well. The intrigue cards, I think, is such a cool thing. You've got the deck building thing going on as well of cards that you use and then, you know, you can trigger it off and do your abilities or go to places based on the card, which can also then be used in combat if you hold on to them. And then you've got the intrigue cards. That, for me, is one of the coolest elements. I'm going back to TCGs, but it's almost like that magic interaction of an instant aha <laughs> i love that you know and there's different types of intrigue cards some are for end game scoring some are for haha moments in combat some of the plot cards where you can just play on the turn as well which can give you ability as well the race element of the game as well sometimes you're rushing sometimes you're not you're looking at everyone else is he gonna rush am i gonna am i gonna rush because he's gonna rush am i gonna focus on getting something else over here that can benefit me later I just absolutely love Dune. It is all my favorite mechanics rolled into one game. And I'll probably say that about one other game. But... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I get why people like this game. Like, I'm, I, I, I'm definitely in the minority about this. Like, we, we always reference Shop and Sit Down because we love those guys. And um, they just recently did a, a sort of a re-review on Dune Imperium after not really liking it a few years back. Yeah. And then they were like, actually, we're wrong. We love this game. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> I, I sort of liked it when I first played it. I just don't, I'm not in love with the game. One of the reasons for that is that experience of Dune is kind of like, some people describe it as like Game of Thrones in space or like Star Wars in space. I don't even think it's like Star Wars really because I think it's just, it's so much intrigue and politics in, in that whole mm. sort of, in that story. And I don't necessarily think Dune Imperium simulates that. What it does as a game should be applauded, don't get me wrong. But I actually think the old Dune game did mm. a better job of that. Mm. And that old Dune game, also reviewed by Shop and Sit Down, I actually think it's the best review that they've ever done. If you guys haven't watched that review by Shop and Sit Down, just watch it. Mm. Um, is just so entertaining talk, hearing about the stories of that game because that game mm. sort of simulates the stories and politics b b between the players, right? Yeah. Who are sort of pretending to be one of the factions. One would be the Bene Gesserit and mm. one would be like the Harkonnens and stuff. Mm. And they all have these sort of game-breaking powers. So so like if you played Cosmic Encounters, another really popular game, everyone has these sort of totally game-breaking powers, don't they? Every faction is totally different. Mm. Um, and you can sort of reveal it whenever you want. You're like, ha ha, you know, I'm, <laughs> you can't convince me to do anything or, you know, <laughs> or I can, you know, st stab you in the back now. Mm. And you just don't see it coming mm. that was a sort of design perspective that they took that they're going to make it really quite asymmetrical by the mm. sort of house factions that you have and i, I remember the Bene Gesserit because they're, they're supposed to be the sort of like these sort of mystic women and, and they can sort of ask a question at any point in, in the game and then that person has to be honest with you and that's one of the points <laughs> that they made in, 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 in the ship and sit down video and I think that is kind of like that captures that experience mm. of Dune for, for me that feels like Dune yeah. and maybe maybe my expectations were sort of unrealistic going into Dune Imperium because I wanted that experience but it is more of an area control game which is sort of less my cup of tea but maybe one that I'd really like I, I, I need to really sit down and, and form my opinions on that one first for me it definitely hit all, all the marks for theme for me I, it felt like yeah it's a worker placement game but the actions you were doing collecting spice going to the desert or then moving over to the different houses and trying to interact with them gaining powers or abilities from them which seemed kind of linked with the different houses some of them were conflict heavy some were knowledge heavy so I, I, that really worked well for me and I think one of the parts of the game that sometimes gets overlooked is the conflict itself more complex than I think people realize on first impression and i understand maybe it's the reason you might not like the game as much due to the conflict actually being more important than it might initially look that is the reason i love the game so have you played um, uprising yet i haven't no okay uh, i've played uprising but that's about a few people what do you prefer sort of uprising or, or mm. the original dune imperium i think my opinion is probably uh, the original dune imperium mm. I think you might like Uprising more because you're talking about how you enjoy the conflict. But the biggest sort of difference, or one of the biggest differences that they, they introduced was the sandworms. And the sandworms like triple your score that you get off of the cards, Those the scorecards. interesting sandworm figures. Yeah, the interesting sandworm figures, yeah. Mm. If you <laughs> turn them. <laughs> <laughs> it, it puts even more of a focus on combat. Dude. Before we go into the top three, because it's so hard to pick 10 games and only 10 games, I'm going to talk about our honourable mentions. Games that do deserve to be mentioned, didn't quite make 
the list. Gaia Project, amazing resource management game where you're sort of terraforming planets, making them habitable, spreading your economy and then mm. that sort of game. It's a, it's a very sort of Euro style game, but set in space, beautiful artwork. I think we've only played it a handful of times. When we have played it, I've loved it, but it takes a little while to grasp the rule book because it's a reasonably complex game. I just want to play it more before I really form my opinion on that game, but I do think very positively that, about that game. Had I played it more, I think it would have found a space in the top, top five. I didn't really talk about deck building games in my list. So I want to mention at least one deck building game and I thought, yeah. what's my favorite deck building game? And it's Ascension. Okay, cool. So Ascension is designed by an ex-MTG pro. I can't yeah. remember his name. We'll put it on the screen here somewhere. And he's taken a lot of inspiration for like the color pie and magic. But the theme is quite, I mean, I suppose it's kind of high fantasy. Actually thinking about it, there's quite a lot of overlap with that in magic, isn't there? Yeah. Maybe that's why I like it so much, but it's in the form of a deck building game. So mm. you're sort of, you're building your deck as you're going along. I love the art work of the first sort of iteration of it they mm. sort of changed it in later iterations and stuff and, and the new sort of board game version that they did mm. it's not a particularly thematic game but it just does its mechanics perfectly instead of battling each other you're trying to collect points i just think it's the most balanced uh, of them and i think it mm. shows that somebody who's like a competitive magic player has gone and really sort of thought about the balance of the game and hence it's a very skillful game like the best player will always win because that's why tom always wins that game right <laughs> yeah. he's just stupidly good at these sort of games <laughs> that, that's the most fun i've had with a pure deck building game I love, yeah. and dominion is a great game as well of all the deck builders attention is that is the one that I would pick. I think mm. it's I think it's so much fun. Arkmore of the card game. Why do we not play this game more? Yeah. Again, it's just like one that I, I, I think would deserve a place in my top 10 if we played it more. And we just played through, through the first scenario and we were just sort of totally mind blown by it. And we we're like, yes, we need to play this game more. And then never got back to it. Amazing thematic, immersive experience as a card game. The best of its kind in terms of the living card games that's sort of still on the market. Mm. I know there's a big following for Lord of the Rings and that sells really well in the store too. Mm. But Arkham Horror for me is just, it's the best. Yeah. And then they did Arkham Horror 2, the, the dog's version. Yeah. <laughs> Immediately makes it like an amazing game, right? Right. 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10 just game, right? Name. Just just for, just for the name, yeah. <laughs> We've got a bit of overlap even on our uh, honorable mentions. Yeah. Guy Project. Guy Project, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, this is just us saying that we should play this game more, right? Yeah, okay, so that, you need to get Guy Project and put it on that yeah, uh, put it over there. To so play pile. You know, to play pile, yeah. yeah. So yeah, there's not much more I really can add to Guy Project. It's an amazing game. It was one that we played and we were like, well, maybe we need another player. <laughs> we want to try this a few more times. We've only ever played it two player, I think. So yeah, my second honorable mention it might be a surprise to you. It is Sleeping Gods. Okay. Yeah. I, I, to be honest, I'm surprised by that. How can that not be in your top 10? That game is awesome, man. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> And I loved it. It was one of my favorite experiences in board gaming, but I just didn't want to bring in games which were legacy games or per se or campaign -y games. That was one thing I, I didn't do for my top. I know it wasn't even something I discussed with you. Like, by the way, Fez, we shouldn't mention legacy games. I did myself that I wasn't going to mention that. So watch the rest of his top three are just all going to be legacy games now. But yeah, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about Sleeping Gods because I feel that you're probably going to talk about it. So I'm going to give you the space for that. And if he doesn't, then I will talk about it at the end. <laughs> and finally, an honorable mention for me is one of my absolute personal favorites. It's a easy game to pick up it's a two-player game i've played it with you i've played it with friends i've played it with my partner i've played it with absolutely everyone it is probably my go-to game if i've got one person with me they, they, they just were like what game should we play i grab this game is it splendor it's not splendor no. okay it's jaipur jaipur yeah yeah, yeah. Jaipur is a great game. Yeah, I, I love Jaipur. I think it's a brilliant game. I think it's one of the best ga gateway games, isn't it? It's it's so easy to pick up. I've only played this once against somebody, and they were like, "Yeah, it's just this game's boring." Mm. Everyone else I played it, I was like, "Yeah, this game's awesome." Like, mm. you know, I didn't realize you could do this with with card games, and it's beautiful. Beautiful game. Great game. Okay. All right, let's let's get into the meat of this. Is it time for the top three? Seems like <laughs> you know me a little too well, Sad. <laughs> let's talk about it. <laughs> let's let's talk about Sleeping Gods. Yeah. Come on, man. Like, how is this not in your top 10? <laughs> how is it not number one? <laughs> Are you telling me that experience that we had when we played that game? It was not amazing. absolutely yeah. life-changing for you. It was, it was. Did you not think after playing that, like, I did not think that's even possible to achieve that sort of experience yeah. in that game? It was outstanding. The, the whole sandbox nature of it. I, I'm a big fan of Ryan Lockett and I, 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 I'm glad I have the opportunity to talk about him. We played a few of his games and I really like him as a designer. He's kind of like this one-man shop, right? He, he sort of designs the games, he does the artwork for it, he publishes it. Absolutely incredibly talented designer. And his masterpiece, without a doubt, is Sleeping Gods. I think widely recognized as his sort of greatest achievement. And then I think it, it, 
it was his, his sort of either his wife or his daughter that went and wrote a soundtrack to that game as well, which was actually like really good, really sort of immersive and thematic. You can play in the background when you play the game. He always comes across like really lovely as well. And like I've seen him in interviews and stuff like Dice Tower. When we bought Empires of the Void 2, his other game, there was a piece missing, wasn't there? Ryan Lockett, of all people, <laughs> <laughs> replied to, to yeah. Saad's email. And was like, hey, I'm really sorry. Um, mm. I'll, I'll get it shipped across for you as a replacement. And no cost. The whole customer experience um, mm. fr from those guys in Red Raven Games is so good. I just want to give a huge shout out to them. I think th they're all awesome. Um, and they've given me some awesome experiences for board games. And, and this is why Sleeping Gods is number three. But let's actually talk about Sleeping Gods. Let's talk about the game. Sleeping Gods is a game where you are chucked into the deep end. You're, you're, you're the captain of this ship and you've gone through some fog and when you come out the other side of the fog, you've realized suddenly in this world with monsters and fantastical beings and these gods and you have to gather crewmates, explore this world, solve mysteries, solve quests, meet people along the way, build alliances, and then ultimately escape. And it's all about that sort of narrative experience. There's no other game that's really captured that sort of same experience. Kind of reminds me of those old sort of like mini clip RPG games that you used to play, where it's like, you know, you're just some person in a random sort of like IP franchise or something, but in 2D sort of overworld and you explore here and he gives you a clue. And you're like, oh, I'll go back to this guy and I can go back here and then, it sort of plays almost like this role-playing game. It, it, it just captures that as a, as a board game, but but does it better than any of anything else that tried to do uh, anything similar to, to it before? The artwork's beautiful. The little ship miniature is beautiful as well. And it's just, just the perfect amount of miniature in a game to, to give you that theme of like, you know, so it has this open, open world book, which is kind of like the map. So you open it up and then you sort of travel along these sort of sections of the map. Mm -hmm. And when you get to your edge, you sort of go to the next page and you carry on and it's just this open world and it does it so slickly, you know, without having have, having to have any sort of large setup in it. But it has this board where you have your other characters and you sort of assign characters fluidly when you go into like the scenario of the game and combat. And it sort of encourages the discussion, you know, you, you sort of you sit there excitingly sort of waiting for the next section of uh, of the sort of storybook to, to, to explain to you what's going to happen and you listen to Saad's terrible voice acting as he tells you the ending <laughs> to the story you know have we resolved everything there's very few games that have ever gripped me that much really drove me to carry on playing this game mm. until we sort of got through it all the way and I think we all felt about that about this game it's just one that I think so fondly of I'm also not telling you any news because this is really well documented all over the internet how amazing this game is if you haven't played it please just go play it it, it was a universe I didn't want to leave my number three is side side must be up there for you <laughs> so side the og hybrid board game it is i, I i'm gonna go with that because for me it's the og it's the first time i had ever seen a board game which implemented these American elements and these European elements and integrated some so perfectly as well. So after the Great War, all these European continents are vying for the land and trying to either exist or, you know, take over. It gives you a lot of freedom, this game. The war's over and you want to decide what's going to happen next. There's all this barren land out in front of you. There's a mysterious factory just in the middle. Who knows what goes on at the factory? <laughs> Something, something's happening. Maybe you want to go check it out. Maybe you don't. And, and this is what it's about. You can either just sit back, do your own thing, or you can go full force and just try messing everyone else up. And it's that level of freedom in that game which is just absolutely nuts you might have a player who is maybe usually a bit annoying and he just wants to annoy everyone in the game but going to war is costly very costly then the action sequence of how you do your action so you can't do the same action you've got the pawn on your little player board and the player board's so cool as well because you upgrade and you level up and really have to think about your engine from that board as well but then the player board gives you the different action spaces as well so it means that Maybe you did movement one time. It doesn't mean then the next turn you can do movement again. You have to think about what am I going to do next. And that makes it very interesting once again in how you choose your actions. The presence of the board. And like we bought the large board, the extended board of it. And it, it takes up this entire table. You can't see the full table. It's a pretty big table and it takes up this full thing. The experience I had from it, you know, that was one of those board games. It was like, wow, this is what you can do with board games. It's one of those games that I keep going back to and back to. I play it digitally. I play it on, physically. It just gets better and better with each play. Scythe has aged so well and it's just consistently been such a great experience for me playing. I should put it on my list. Um, what? Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad I went on on for a bit there yeah you, uh, i probably should have i probably should have. i'm looking at this and i'm thinking Are you yeah. giving me loads about sleeping gods and you haven't even stuck side it, on it's tough to talk about 10 games but i was i was certain that you were going to talk about this one <laughs> all right okay. like 
I would just, you know, I'd, I'd fit in to 11 or something like that. It's, it's so close up to, to my top 10. Scythe is just the most tight strategy experiences around. And I think it suits somebody who doesn't necessarily like conflicting games quite well for a game that does have strong elements of area control in it as well. It's a highly competitive game. It's a complex game, but not so complex that you're going to drive away a bunch of people. It, it's it's very well balanced where you get a huge amount of meat. It's a very point salad game, multiple paths to victory. And you only need to complete six objectives to end the game, but you've got multiple objectives available to do. The encounter cards are really cool. I like the way how we usually play the encounter cards is that the person doing the encounter has, has a picture and rather just reading the card, it has a little bit of text on it. We well, usually get, just that like, gives you the options, doesn't it? Yeah, it just sort of gives you it sort of displays AB, it. whatever. Yeah, do A, B, but. And then, but we just secretly look at the card and describe what we see to each other and make a story up on the encounter. This is the freedom of the game, isn't it? You know, this is what it gives us. Uh, as a package it's, it's absolutely amazing it can be kind of brutal it can be kind of peaceful but whichever way you go it's always going to be competitive what an experience this is board game 101 and then I, I think we've mentioned it already in a previous video but the components you've got plastic components for the american part of the game or the american inspired part of the game and then you have wooden components for the Euro european inspired part of the game i think that's brilliant you know that's a little kind of little Easter egg for board gamers. Let's play side. I I, I wanna, really want to play the expansion for it, actually, Rise of Fenrir. We've been dying I, to I, do that I, campaign. Yeah, I've heard so many good things about that. Um, yeah. And we haven't sat down to properly play it yet. But even without that campaign, that game is like, it, it deserves huge praise. Mm -hmm. And it gets lots of praise. Um, yeah. It is, I think it's regarded as Stone Myers. Greatest game. The main thing about the game really makes it for me is the art. Jamie had seen the art first and then was inspired to make the board game based on that art and did a collaboration. And the art in this is just oh, the, the world building that art does for you. I think it, it is the board game equivalent of Godfather, you know. But there is a Godfather game. There is a Godfather game. And that's great too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Not top 10. <laughs> yeah, but I still love it, actually. That is a cool game. I want to play that again. But for me, it really is the Godfather of games. How Godfather, you know, movies existed. There were greats. There were things that changed the game and revitalized the arts as well. But Godfather came along. And it changed everything after it. Everything after Scythe. It, it, it was the game changer. Dude Imperium, Lost Ruins of Arnak. None of those games would exist without Scythe before Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I feel like depending on the day, this could have been my Yeah, I know. I totally agree with you. Now. We could film this on a different day and we'd probably come up with a different list, wouldn't we? No. But this is just a snapshot in time. So. Number two. I feel like you know me a little too hot. Yeah. Pandemic legs. <laughs> I've guessed them all. <laughs> Well, we'll take a guess at each other's first one then. Uh, Let's see if we can guess it. Pandemic Legacy is the best version of Pandemic. It's probably the greatest legacy game, at least of the ones that I've played. It is just the most intriguing story ever placed into a board game. It's gripping, it's intense, it's stressful, and it gets people together to have an absolutely amazing time. I I've never had that sort of experience of like feeling so stressed out as to what what's going to happen and, and, mm. and being so excited to find out what's going to happen in the story. Um, and it balances it so well of sort of slowly introducing you to I suppose it actually it doesn't necessarily slowly introduce you to Pandemic. It kind of has the expectation that you've played Pandemic before and you can beat Pandemic. So you, you, you kind of have to be at that point before picking this up. But if you have got to that point and you haven't played Pandemic Legacy Season 1, well, you probably should pick it up. It's a little bit like COVID really, isn't it? <laughs> Even more than <laughs> Pandemic already is. I, I, I'm not going to talk about the story mm. um, just because that is probably the greatest part of the whole thing. But there's twists and turns and things that you would not expect to happen and decisions that you have to make that will really sit you down staring at your teammates thinking, oh, damn what shall we do and you will win some and you will definitely lose some too mm -hmm. um, it doesn't matter how good you are a player at pandemic you will lose some of those games and you will get the bad outcome mm -hmm. and that is the way to play this game because it's legacy and it says to destroy this piece and you should totally when it says to destroy something you should destroy it because there's no going back and that just builds up that sort of intensity and that experience towards it that's something legacy games can't you know have over any other mm. any other type of game that the legacy games can do that every you know, at the end of every chapter you'll open something new it's an experience unlike any others it is the best legacy game i played yeah i'm gonna say it i'm just yeah. gonna go out and say it's the best legacy game i played it's the best legacy game I've ever played. It's a truly, truly special experience um, and one that I wish I could forget and play all over again. And that experience, that group, the group was just amazing. We all had that shared experience with this game. There's few board games that can really bring a, a group of people together. And even now, like we're, we're very close with that group. Yeah, so whenever we see the other two, we just look at each other and we sort of have that look or like, 
we remember that time when we played yeah, Pandemic Legacy. Yeah. You know, we, we say it without saying. We just look at each other. Yeah. And it's only a few things in life that can really give us some experience. But Pandemic Legacy is one of them. Mm. And that is why you should play it. Number two, Caverna. Yeah, you've spoken about Caverna. I, I'm kind of surprised how little overlap there was. I was expecting more overlap, yeah. but there wasn't that much. Caverna, I mean, I think you, you, you've said it. It is the ultimate Euro worker placement game of all time. In my humble opinion, what else can I say about it? You've said it mostly, you know, you're playing as these cave dwarves, building, you know, either a massive mansion into a mountain or trying to build the most extreme farm in the land. <laughs> you know, it's so much freedom in the game. So many options. I said, cute dogs and babies. What more do you want? I played the game not even caring whether I'm going to win or not. And every single time I've played it, I've won. I'm just going to mention. <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. <laughs> Follow your heart. <laughs> Not your head. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm interested you didn't think A Feast for Odin was a better game. Because I think when we played that, I, I got the impression that you thought that was a better game. I love Feast for Odin. I think you, you mentioned the same thing, that we could have sat here and done 10 games of Uwe Rosenberg. I, I could have mentioned, at least in the top 10, I could have easily mentioned about 3-4 of Uwe Rosenberg games. I had to pick one which I thought was my favourite. Caverna for me, I, I agree with you on that one. Feast for Odin is definitely my second. Yeah, Fe Feast for Odin is probably my second favourite of his games. You haven't played Le Havre though, I'm telling you. You play Le Havre. I think I probably, <laughs> yeah, I think I probably like that game. Um, that should, should really play. devastating. Yeah, yeah, it sounds exactly like my cup of tea Caverna, I mean you've, you've said enough about it I won't go on too much play it play it play it play it now am I guessing you're number one yeah all right go oh, and try and guess my number guess one. you're number one. Ooh, I, you know what I'm surprised actually because I, I I honestly thought sleeping cards would be your number one so you're, you're top three there's no campaign games why are you asking me that just to try and figure out what your number one is. Uh, I'm, can I, I ask actually... you questions? <laughs> no. <laughs> what are you asking me? This is my video. Yeah, all right. I'm the one editing it. <laughs> uh, Azul. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not Azul. What is it? I it's definitely go. not Azul. <laughs> Oh, I know exactly what it is. Of course, there's only one game it could be. Yeah, I think it's Mansions of Madness. Yeah, it's Mansions of Madness. Mansions All right. of Madness. It's Mansions of Madness. <laughs> yeah. Second edition, specifically. Yeah. Designed by Corey Kanitsky. Yeah. Um, and published by Fantasy Flight Games. It is a Lovecraft Craftian dungeon crawler game. That's app driven, but one of the best examples of an app driven game. One of the issues that they had with this game in the first edition, well, some people sort of consider it an issue, but the way that the first edition worked is that you had a game master who kind of had this book that they were going through and they sort of guided everyone through the experience. To be a bit sort of RPG-esque, I suppose, right? To be mm. a bit D&D-esque. And I totally appreciate that, you know, you get some amazing experiences with those, but nobody ends up really wanting to be Dungeon Master, but when you, particularly when playing board games, there's always that prep work you've got to do beforehand. So they dropped that and they basically let the app do that. They created one of the most immersive and intense experiences I've ever had in my whole life. I suppose the theme of the sort of top three that I have here is, is I always had this moment when I was playing that game and I was like, wow, I didn't even know you could achieve this in a board game. I think that is just by definition, what is, you know, something that's pioneering, that's amazing, that's great. Is, is something in that medium that cannot be created in any other medium before and I you know I, I talk about video games to people and I think like Metal Gear Solid is one of the best examples of that and that's something that cannot be done in any other medium don't care to watch the movie that they're going to announce for it and I think Mansions of Madness is the same it used every tool to its best ability to create that experience and and I think that's why it sort of took the direction with the app because it sort of took away the, the, the need for the game master we just had such an intensely like immersive experience when we played mm. this game yeah. um, again an, an experience that we played with other two brothers don't really like playing board games with us but they had an amazing time playing this we've already shown the picture and it has a soundtrack that plays on the like the device that you'll be playing it on it perfectly balances um the experience that i was hoping that something like gloomhaven would would provide to me i'm trying not to make this this whole sort of what top one section about mm. gloomhaven but i had some expectations about gloomhaven for it to be this sort of rpg experience mm. and really sort of balance that rpg experience and then gloomhaven ended up being this experience that's so driven by combat i don't dislike the combat i enjoy the combat in gloomhaven but it's so intensely sort of focused the whole pacing of that game is created around the combat and it's not something that i wanted in that experience i wanted something that sort of did a better job of building up the narrative building up that suspense and that exploration and that experience was was Mansions of Madness for me. Did that so perfectly. And they really took their time to design those whole scenarios and sort of think, you know, think we're gonna open up and build the intensity here and we'll have a crescendo here. And then suddenly the, the intensity is mm. gonna build up and then it's gonna finally finish at this sort of point. That storytelling that Gloomhaven could not capture for me, unfortunately, was captured by Mansions of Madness. People talk about these water cooler moments because like when you're at work and you sort of gather around the water cooler to have a drink and you're like, oh, I remember that time when we... <laughs> When, when we were in Mansions of Madness and, and, and there was that door and we asked Snoop to go to the door and we knocked at the door and then we said to Snoop, what happened at the, the door? And he's like, there's a terrifying noise and I ran away. And 
<laughs> then we played it the second time and we found out that we needed to open the door because <laughs> that's the person that's going to find the, you know, the yeah, thing. To, uh, and I'm giving yeah. too much away here. I feel like I'm giving too much away. Yeah. Damn um, you, Snoop. Damn you, Snoop. Should have opened um, the door. I think pretty much everyone I've played it with has had an awesome time. I've mentioned in the video already, like I don't necessarily love apps within games. It's almost a distraction. The whole point in like board games and tabletop games is to put everything digital away and, you know, look at your, your, your the person at the, at the table and interact with them. That's mm. kind of the whole point. And then sometimes you just kind of get bit fix you get fixated on the app. This is the Search Planet X, you don't get fixated on mm. the app. Mm. Um, on this, there is a tendency to get fixated on the app because the app will display the whole board. They'll also explain to you how to do it. And there's some people that also think that the first edition was better because of the really tight experience that they could have created if you had a dungeon master mm. right behind it because the you know there's something special when the human controls the story and, and and the sort of the way things sort of fall out if they're good at that if you want to have somebody who's like a game master they can sort of take the app hide the app from everyone take the information from the app relay it back to people as mm. you're like the game master and i played the game once like that and i had a lot of fun and it's almost like this guided dm experience i, I, I don't think many people are sort of using it in that way but it does work quite well in that way it does, I, and I, I did exactly the same i just used it as a dungeon master tool almost and it's yeah. a great tool though, and I didn't show anyone else what it gives you the ability to do is that you not only can you be the dungeon master with this tool because the tool's doing so much it allows you to then play the game as well I mean it's, it's, it's easy to put this at number one because mm. I, the, just the most fond memories I've ever had of a game I, I'm not actually somebody who likes horror that much you quite, I mm. think maybe people will be surprised because I talk a lot about <laughs> like the Arkham horror stuff yeah. and there's a whole commentary on like Lovecraft and, and his racist views and stuff like that and mm. I think we put that to a side and sort of em em embrace the good aspects of of what he created using his sort of the the, the things that he came up with or, or the ideas he sort of concepted and putting in in a board game just makes things so immersive i like being you know immersed into it and i think the horror aspect just enhances that immersion because I, I don't necessarily like watching horror movies but i no. do really like this so you don't necessarily need to like horror what you need to enjoy is being uh, immersed in the experience mm. so if you like that then you you probably love Mansions Mad. All right. Can you guess my number one? No, I'm struggling with your number one. I can't actually think. I feel like you've mentioned all your great games. What are you talking about? Being mean, like a favorite game of all time. I thought you knew me better than this first. It's not a dexterity game, is it? <laughs> Could be. Is it Pitch Cars? Pitch Cars! Oh no, it's not. Oh, you know no. what? I threw you off on this one. Did you? Yeah, it's Terraforming Mars. Uh, <laughs> it's an okay game. It's my favorite game. Not an okay game. Yeah, I mean, this deserves to be in somebody's number one. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an overlap. You've mentioned it already. As you said, you play as a corporation funded by the world government. You get sent to Mars and you have to go raise the temperature on Mars, sort the oxygen levels out on Mars. Create oceans on Mars so that trees and everything in life can exist. What a game. Drafting element, as you mentioned, is one of my favorite things. Working out synergies of your cards, the set collection, the tile placement, the whole board thing going on over there. This is also all of my other favorite mechanics rolled into a whole nother game. It does everything absolutely perfect. I know you've played a lot of the digital version, but I just love playing this one face to face. One of the things I think that I gained as a benefit from playing it as a physical copy was reading that rule book the rule book blew my mind not in the way that it taught me but the information it gave me as it was teaching me the game yeah. all of a sudden i was like oh this is a thing that this was all science fiction turns out it is possible if you do the right things and the game is based on the actual events that need to occur to do that and I was just like, that was like when I watched Arrival for the first time, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you actually would do this if you were trying to communicate with aliens. You actually would do this if you were trying to terraform Mars and then the game itself. The decision making, the knowledge on each of the cards is immense, potentially pulls off one of the best mechanically designed games of all time. Then the variability in the game, it's never going to be the same game twice. There's only one of each card in that stuck in the standard set of the base game. Everything I expect from a board game, then it exceeds on all of those things as well. And, and then I think one of the other great things, not only was the drafting, but then the engine building element of the game. This is mind blown. And I'm surprised you didn't guess it because in the tier list video, I was telling you that's my number. Number one. That's how I knew that your number one was going to be much and some madness. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose I haven't watched that video. I don't well, watch our videos afterwards. You, you know? should do. It was a good video. <laughs> Terraforming Mars is the economic sci-fi masterpiece of board games. And if you don't like the whole theme of it and want something that's probably a bit slicker, a bit quicker, try Ark Nova, because that's also a fantastic game. Um, it could have easily taken a spot in, on one of these lists. It was one or the other, and I, I went with sci-fi and drafting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Prelude, I think, is a must. It gets the game rolling incredibly quick. It saves you about half an hour at the start. I'd even say 15, 20 minutes, half an hour or so of game at the start, but it's slow. It gives you 
the boost you need and just gets you into the meat of the game pretty fast and the only other thing i would recommend is the player boards oh, they, they suck man they're just thin pieces of cardboard that flap and if you knock them all the components go everywhere and you're like oh, i don't know where everything was <laughs> to upgrade my game was get the dual uh, boards yeah they're, they're totally worth they're a must now, the game is reasonably slow to begin with i think it's quite intentional but possibly a little too slow so that was their sort of chance to try and rebalance the early game just gives you a little bit more resources a little bit more focus to begin with and then sets you off on, a, on the right foot for, for the rest of the game but yeah that is my number one i want more board game recommendations i want to talk more about board games yeah man i love talking about board games yeah yeah should we do a tier list we've done the tier list done the tier list check it here the tier list it's cool is it there it might be here. <laughs> it might be there so i'm just gonna put two fingers like there and there and hopefully there's somewhere here is it there and there i don't know don't put it on my face please <laughs>